Robin, Aditi, Anirudh, thank you so much for joining The Road Less Traveled. This episode is special for me because I've never actually had three guests at one time. So I'm expecting it to be triple the fun. I always have fun in these conversations. And The Road Less Traveled is a series we started between Game, Your Story and Network Capital to really talk to people in India about alternative paths, not just, hey, the only thing I can do is go out there and get a job. But entrepreneurship is an option. And here are people who've tread that path. It doesn't mean it's a bed of roses, but it's exciting. So thank you so much for joining this and uh, being a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to having a good road trip together. Uh, and on that note, uh, how did the, the, the road trip between the three A's begin? Uh, I, have a, I have some brief that the two of you are married. I heard it was Ashwin and Aditi and Anirudh is the other partner. But then Ashwin tells me that some people think it's Ashwin and uh, Anirudh are married. <laughs> and, uh, and the third wheel is <laughs> But uh, on a serious note, I'd like you to take, go back, travel back in time a little before Pocket Aces was started. Uh, any one of you can start with that. With that. Um, sure, I'll, I'll take this. Uh... So it's complicated. So I'm going to try to do this uh, in, a, in a simple, simple manner. Each of the three of us has a relationship with each of the three of us or the other two um, independently. And each of these relationships are quite long. So I think the, the longest relationship goes back between Aditi and Anirudh. They grew up in Kuwait at the same time and went to the same high school. And I think they know each other from either seventh grade or ninth grade. So sometime, well, I, maybe I shouldn't date you guys. So sometime in some decade uh, that's yes. definitely by Same gone. Same class sitting right behind each other. <laughs> right. So that's relationship one. Uh, relationship two happened when Anirudh and I met at university. Uh, I was a second year student. I was a sophomore at the University of Illinois and Ani had just joined as a freshman. And I'd heard this rumor of this new guy who was coming in from Kuwait who was very good at cricket. And I was trying to put together my cricket team. So I, I had an, uh, an avid interest in, in meeting him and we became... Uh, best of buddies, we actually started a cricket team, uh, which ended up doing quite well. Um, and we were, we became roommates uh, at college. And then um, Aditi and I met uh, when we had all graduated college and were working in New York. Uh, and we met partly because there was a social circle overlap, thanks to Aditi and Anirudh's common friends, uh, because, you know, that was the same gang that would hang out together in New York. And through my connection with Anirudh, I ended up hanging out with them and vice versa. And so that's how we met. Uh, and Aditi and I have been married now oh, nearly 10 years, 10 years next month. So basically, so this was meant to be. How did Pocket Aces come about? It's one thing, hey, you meet someone who you think, uh, who you know plays good cricket, you want him on your cricket team, you meet Aditi somewhere else, you'll click. How do Anirudh, Ashwin and Aditi Say, hey, we want to start a business together. And, and how did that idea for that business come about? So I'm usually the one answering this question. So this time I'm going to lob it to either Aditi or Anirudh um, and then have them Go answer. Go for it, Ani. Yeah, I think the you know idea, the, the stereotype of an idea is that we sit in a cafe or in a garage and the idea appears. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, you know, I think that, that it's time that that stereotype is broken so that more people can actually feel it's normal that it doesn't come to them while they're sitting at their desks or lounging on their sofa. Um, we started, you know, Ashwin had been um, uh, actively working in the Indian media industry for about two years, uh, you know, when I came back to India. And he had been uh, really trying to uh, entice me with, various nice pieces of content that he was sending my way to read because I had a lot of time in the US to read um, because I had no friends. So he was like, here are your friends, script A and B. And uh, I started reading them and I thought this is exciting. And when I came to, uh, you know, then he said, well, look, this is a media revolution that may happen here. So I came down to Bombay to uh, check it out. Um, and that's how we really got started. We just felt India's 
cultural context and relevance um, was not being reflected in the size of our entertainment industry and customers were not being thought of in the same way as we would like uh, to think of them and we started with uh, you know with an idea of serving better content to india but very quickly we realized uh, that the need of the hour was to serve content to india in the way india was consuming content which was through the phone um and we asked the question of what does mobile entertainment look like and just around that time when we actually started thinking of relevant questions aditi joined us as well um and we kind of tricked her into joining us because we told her <laughs> yeah. us, you know she was looking uh, to take a little bit of a break from her previous uh, stints where she was also uh, helping a lot of entrepreneurs make real impact in the world and um uh, you know initially we told her come for 2 hours then then it was 4 hours and one day she looked at us and said well i've been here almost 15 16 hours this was supposed to be a vacation and i think at that point you know we all realized that we should work together <laughs> i think it was like one day a week then it somehow became four days a week and then eventually we like yeah just let's make this work right before so, so i yeah that's how we got started and and the idea has evolved over time right um and and today we always you know we say that you know what's driving us today is how do we help people uh, solve boredom and like how we, how do we help them entertain themselves throughout the day um and that's something that we think about quite actively uh before i move on that thread um, anirudh uh, ashwin and uh, aditi i want to still stay at that point right when you when you find there's an opportunity there's a problem you want which is typically what you want entrepreneurs to do but there is also typically the the safety net of a job right you have x amount coming in uh it it's cushy did all of you one of you did any of you have that apprehension of jumping into this or or you said no you know what this is what i want to do i so, guess all of us need to answer that so maybe i'll yeah. take if you first. i'd like to hear from <laughs> each of you that experience of becoming an entrepreneur yeah so sandhya that's a really interesting question um you know when ashwin and i were in new york and we decided to come to india to pursue our passions um for me for ashwin that was media right from the beginning he knew that he wanted to do that and for me it was uh, development so i worked in the social development space uh, for about 5 years after coming to india and i think for us that was that scary point um you know because we were working on wall street we all come from very middle class uh, families service oriented families i think all three of us are the first entrepreneurs in our extended families so it was a big deal for us because our parents you know believed that they have gone to the middle east to work and for them sending us to the to top universities in the us and the fact that we are earning wall street salaries was a big deal so uh, convincing them that you know we would leave this cushy world like you said um and you know living in manhattan you feel like you're in the center of the universe yeah. um and you know coming to india to kind of live in our adult lives for the first time uh that was actually where the uh, where the jitters were at least for me and i remember asking ashwin that you know we've only been to india on holidays and it's great fun <laughs> but living there is a completely different ball game Mm. and uh, you know the small things you know about like how long it takes to open a bank account and those kind of things absolutely that bother you when you come here so i think what kind of helped us keep a fun attitude was the fact that ashwin and i at least looked at it as like a two year adventure mm. we were like hum india aake dekhenge kya hota hai we are just going to have fun for two years and we are going to see what happens and the plan b was that okay you know a uh, worst case it'll make a great story for a business school application okay. so that was kind of you know the the plan b for us and um, but luckily you know i you know it's worked out and now it's been what uh, nine and a half years that we've been here uh, when i actually came to the social development space right and i was kind of what you may call it an intrapreneur i was starting like a new business within uh, intelic app which is the company i joined and social space pays nothing mm. right and so it was kind of like whatever a 99% pay cut and 
right away you know that you know okay you are definitely following your passions we had some good savings so i think that kept us in good stead so i think we told each other that as long as we are not really dipping into our savings uh you know we will try to to make the most out of this so uh parents were very jittery uh, i think they became a little bit more relaxed once they started seeing that we are actually doing well in what we are doing um but for the longest time definitely they were like pack your bags and go back <laughs> so i mean they they try to do that at every step right we were, i remember we were flying from uh, new york to mumbai via turkey we, we had a turkish airways ticket and they allowed you at the time i don't know if it's still there to stop in turkey for a few days so we actually stopped for a week uh, to check out turkey and we when we were speaking to aditi's parents a uh, few days a couple of days before we left uh, for india from turkey they said look it's not too late you can still catch catch the return flight and go back in your your visa is still valid no one's going to stop you your employers have told you they'll take you back if you ever wanted um so that i think that you know fear obviously existed and and i don't blame them right in that generation moving westward was a sign of progress and uh, yeah. for for a, a young couple in you know early in their career to quit those jobs cold turkey and move eastward um just didn't seem intuitive uh, I, i think the you know because it was like that two year adventure that i described it wasn't really like terrifying because we knew there was a plan b mm-hmm. um you know luckily we not needed to use the plan b because my you know god knows my gmat scores have expired like five years <laughs> ago and i'm probably too old to be in this school now but um yeah thank god for that and anirudh the your perspective what was it like before you took the jump yeah i think uh, like ashwin and aditi mentioned you have to fool yourself a little bit into doing this because if you think only logically you can never take the step it just makes no sense ever um so anyone who's grappling with this decision you know for all of them they should just know that it never makes sense right if you do the uh, swot analysis or any other analysis that someone taught you whether you do decision trees or whatever you do that outcome never ever feels comfortable um i think for me the uh, it really came down to a simple thing which is that if i'm 50 am i going to regret you know not making managing director or some uh, you know gm ceo type position instead of 50 making it at 48 is that is that going to be a regret that i wasted two years doing something else and i felt that would that be a bigger regret or would it be that um you know india had a revolution and, and while i was growing up all i could think about is you know we build everything around the world but how come we don't build it in india mm-hmm. and if it's happening in india then you know and i don't participate what's going to be uh, a bigger regret so it's it's part of a framework i always call like a regret minimization framework which is like put yourself 20 years in the future and see which will give you less uh, regret so that's kind of how i got over the initial you know jitters but you have to fool yourself plenty of times along the way because I mean, it's crazy. So I had no savings because I spent it all on an expensive jaunt called business school. So, um, <laughs> and uh, taking a loan is not considered good in any of our families. I think, uh, like okay. a lot of India as well. So, um, I think at every point, then then it's just the mission and the people you work with that keep you to get you know keep you going. Otherwise, it, it can get challenging. And you could have raised hundred fifty million dollars, but if you don't like working with the people you're working with or it's boring you will find a way to leave you will leave an hour early you know in the first day and then soon you'll fall out of love with that place so i think um uh, you know uh, having that is really important and that helped me through the whole journey so far uh, you hit on a very important point uh, nearly uh, in fact i think every single person i've spoken to in this series whether it's kiran majumdar show or shraddha sharma or a new entrepreneur or someone like vidit atre the one thing they've consistently said anirudh is purpose and mission they said uh, nothing can be second to that uh, if you really want to build a successful business because otherwise there are so many things that can make you exit but if you're focused on that purpose and that mission it really helps you stay the path um but i still want to stay in the first 100 days i do this specifically because i think sometimes it's easy when you've been successful to romanticize entrepreneurship right yeah. yes. and 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 uh, you forget and 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 uh, 
hindsight is 2020 but the first 100 days and it could be longer but i'd like each of you from your different perspectives because i really think you will bring something different to talk about what those first 100 days the challenges of those first 100 days of setting it could have been longer but just to give a timeline and I'm, I'm saying 100 days aditi do you want to go first about the challenges of those first 100 days of once you'd set up a business yeah, sure. So Sandhya, I will talk about two kinds of first 100 days. Yes. So the first kind was when we had just incorporated. And in fact, in the initial days, we were like a film production company. Mm -hmm. um, and the second part is when we knew we pivoted, we are going to pivot to digital. Um, right. So in the first 100 days, I was more of a unsolicited bystander advisor whatever you might want to call it since these guys used to often work out of our living room yeah. um, and at that time they were working on it full time and uh, you know the first hundred days I would say of that model were frustrating they were exciting because there was clearly an opportunity gap but uh, the film business uh, is a slow and a binary business Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, you know, even if you have a project that you're putting together, uh, say you have a great script that you're putting together and you have a director on board, but getting, say, you know, popular actors on board or um, a producer on board, uh, you know, somebody, a studio on board takes a lot of time. And it was a lot of, from what I remember, great planning and then running around between different people who wouldn't say no, but they also wouldn't say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is my perspective. May, I, I think Ashwin and Anirudh might, might remember it slightly differently. And uh, I remember, you know, always discussing and thinking that in the film business, it always takes long. And, you know, we used to hang out with people who have been waiting for eight years, 10 years for their first film to release. And I remember always talking about the fact that we don't have that long. We don't mm. want to spend that long because the opportunity cost of our time is high, according to us, right? Everybody decides their own opportunity cost. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, that opportunity cost for us is high. And then I think that pushing us to explore what better can we do, where the process is more in our control, Right. And, uh, you know, then sort of pushing ourselves to think much more about digital. Um, these guys went to Cannes for the MIP TV conference. I think that was also an aha moment. I think it was a clear aha moment uh, after which we kind of switched to digital. And then the first hundred days of digital were very different. So that was a lot of research going into. At that time, we were very inspired by BuzzFeed. Uh, in the US and their model and their uh, sort of data driven, consistent, you know, multiple times a week output to success, creating relatable content, which people distributed themselves. So the audience is only distributing your content. So it was, we researched a lot about, um, you know, why people share, why content goes viral and what can, what's been done in India and how can we, you know, bring that model here. And I think that was a lot of fun and a lot of hope we spent time finding what our strategy was going to be, finding the right people, recruiting some very young people straight out of college, a lot of Simbi folks at that time. And then literally building the rules and of the content grammar together with them. Mm -hmm. So all of us learning together, putting out content. I remember 9 September 2015 when our first video went out, Ban Ban on Dice Media. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us will ever forget that feeling. Um, and the fact that that video went viral, um, you know, was we, we like spent a lot of time after that understanding what had actually happened um, and then building our content thesis further after that. So this is how I remember our first two sets of 100 days. I, 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 I will come back to that video going viral. But before that, I want to hear Anirudh and Ashwin's version of the first 100 days, the challenges, the highs, the lows. Yeah, I think I think uh, for me there are some clear moments which were which stand out, right? Uh, one is that Ashwin had left what was a very interesting uh, position at a film studio, which was going to make and end up ma making ended up making uh, excellent movies, right? Especially during the time he was there. 
um, but people wouldn't pick up his call often after that because that chair was not there, right? So we learned who our friends were, people who believed in uh, you know his creative vision or uh, our execution capability versus just a relationship because he had a certain office. I think that for me was very interesting. Second was uh, when we raised money, people always think of raising money as a plaudit, like you did something good. But I think for us, almost it helped us become more disciplined because now we were accountable to someone. And I think this is something for, you know, for com- people who are starting new companies, you end up taking far too long to get to market, mm. right? far too long learning about what uh, the real market is like, because it's comfortable to stay in your shell and, you know, whether you're building a product, which is uh, tech driven or not to just keep it to yourself. I think going out there exposes you to high, harsh reality. And having that pressure of having to deliver to a partner really gives you uh, something to think about and makes you accountable. But it also gives you a resource because you have something that a lot of other people starting off don't. So the capital that I remember that having that, as soon as that capital first hit, um, I felt right away that, uh, you know, something good was going to come out of this. Um, and then I think we made some impossible things happen. So whether it's, pitching an actor at a gym, which I did, or, you know, Ashwin uh, utilizing his relationships to bring some projects together, which would, like, to be honest, a year before that would seem impossible to me. Um, So I think, you know, having those kind of impossibilities happen where we were buying rights to movies or material that we should have no right to do, actually, because we were nobody. And so I think those, in the first 100 days, that really... Um, help, you know, really excited me and you know stuck with me. And then, of course, the stuff that Aditi said. Once we shifted, uh, the energy of working in something new, and really having that purpose of yes, we are finally improving things. Mm-hmm. Um, that sense of uh, you know the missionary zeal was was something that helped you come to work every day because you realize that you are not just another X Y Z. You are trying to actually change the world. You're giving new opportunity. To we used to always call it, uh, in some ways, like how television with, with ZTV and Star, when they started, it changed television in India. It changed artistic ambition. It changed career paths. I felt uh, the same way uh, with, with digital. And luckily, we've been proven right on that. Yeah. I, 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 you Ashwin, know, you? You know, I'll talk about two different phases, right? And And... Uh, I'll take the liberty of stretching the 100 days to maybe 300 days uh, each time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the first was 2015. It was kind of Jan to, you know, maybe November 2015, those 300 days, right? Um, that's when we were first putting to test, as Anirudh said, uh, the strength of the relationships I'd built over the last two years, right? And, and we saw some of those, um, you know, hold and we saw some of them, you know, fall through quite, quite easily. Uh, and so that, you know, there was a sense, I think, early of, hopelessness because you know what it felt like was that you were trying to you know when you try to pick up a lot of boxes or something you pick up a lot of many things from the ground but then something falls and you go back down to pick that up but something else falls you go back down to pick that up something else falls and it's like that yeah. never-ending cycle and so we would you know we would do whatever we could in our hustle I mean these are two you know reasonably well-educated very hard-working uh, reasonably uh, smart guys spending you know 48 you know uh, people hours a day um, working towards one goal, right? So we were making progress, but then every time you got, like Aditi said, you got a director on board, then the studio backed out, or you got the studio on board, um, you know, the actor backed out. Something, some piece or the other would just keep falling. Um, and then the most important thing, so there, there was that sense of dread, that sense of like, how are we ever going to move at the pace we want to move uh, if things, if, if we don't have anything in our control. Um, but then the one thing that, that those 300 days also taught us was it became very clear to us what we did not want to become because we saw this play out time and again. And, and honestly, it's, we've been proved right five years in a row now, six years in a row now, um, should seven years actually, um, that these, at these studios, the decision-making always, you know, we, we, something that we call the hippo effect, right? The highest paid person's opinion. Uh, it was always an opinion driven decision. It was always somebody's touch and feel, somebody's gut, somebody's kind of point of view. Uh, there was never any data backing it. There was never any real insight or never any real analysis about consumer and consumer trend and consumer behavior. Um, and I honestly think, you know, it's amazing that the industry ran on that charade for as long as it did. Uh, of course, the cracks are showing now when when 
there is a threat of digital distribution and, and disintermediation from uh, various global platforms. Uh, but we saw that then and we realized we didn't want to become that. We didn't want to become irrelevant and uh, completely tone deaf to what the consumers wanted. So there was a lot of learning there, but it was almost like the learning that accompanies, um, you know, uh, uh, I suppose that journey when you're not getting the outcome that you desire. What changed as Ani and Aditi both pointed out was the fact that we were able to then go back to our strengths uh, and raising, you know, some amount of money was, you know, along the lines of the skill sets we had. Um, and then I'm going to fast forward from there. So 2014, we spent, uh, sorry, this was, this is to all of 2014. I'm sorry, I mixed up the dates from Jan to November. 2015, we spent setting the bedrock and foundation for what is the business today. Uh, and that was transformational, right? Because it was, you know, like Ani, uh, like Aditi said, we went to Khan uh, and our eyes opened to the possibilities of digital businesses uh, in the content and, and video space specifically. Um, and then we came back and we tested a bunch of things, that video that went viral, which we can talk about. And then 2016, you know, the, the 300 days of 2016, you know, say Jan to the end of the year, that was a true, you know, true transformation moment for us as well, because in Jan is when we really found sustainable product market fit. Um, because throughout 2015, we had been experimenting and yes, we had the viral video and we had the one-off successes, but there was no pattern to them. Mm -hmm. And we hadn't been able to replicate that success. Mm -hmm. In 2016, Jan, something magical started to happen. We saw something go really, really viral. One of the pieces of content we had done on, on filter copy. And then we were able to extract from it some of the core characteristics that we thought made it viral and put it into another piece of content and then another piece of content, another piece of, so it, it started to get addictive like a drug, like every week, every Wednesday at noon, we just felt this like energy that this is going to happen. So you can, I, this is weird feeling, like, you know, when they say that when you know, you know, yeah. that's what is happening in, in, in yeah. you know, 2016, we would, we would be able to tell without fail every single time how something is going to perform, how it's going to do. And we just had that feeling of seeing something take shape. Um, you know, so all of 2016, I think that was just exhilarating. That whole, like, I go back to that journey and the kind of audacious things we did, the kind of scale we reached. I mean, you know, don't forget, we're coming into the market three years, even after digital players have entered, right? Absolutely. The likes of a culture machine and a scoop poop and a TVF and all of these guys have been around. We're coming in after all of that. And by the end of 2016, we were bigger than almost all of them. Uh, on almost every metric that mattered, whether it was viewership or our ability to monetize or, you know, at least the sound fundamentals of our business. So that year was exhilarating and it was a huge contrast to, you know, 2014, which is the year where we were just struggling to find what to do. So I, I think of those two years uh, often when I find ourselves in a difficult position because it's always a journey of how do I go from 2014 to 2016. Uh, and so every day for me is like 2015. It's I'm setting the stone for whatever has to happen um, you know, next year. And, you know, I, I loved listening to that and the two things I take away from that, especially because even at game, we think about that. We have a hairy, audacious goal. Yeah. And, and key to making that goal successful is to figure a replicable model. Mm. You've got to be able to replicate it. It can't be one off. So uh, I, I, com I completely um, uh, understand what you said. I like to talk about something you were so sure about. You said, hey, we figured it out. It's got all of the elements of success. This is really going to be a winner, but it failed. Is there some such thing that you have? Because I always like to touch on this, uh, the three A's, I'm going to call you the three A's, because I feel like it's important for people who are starting out on this to understand there are going to be times like that. Yeah, I think, yeah, go ahead. Aditha. Actually, each of us might have different examples. Or each of you to give me a different example. I need, I need start, start. Yeah, I think for, for me, the, um, uh, you know, our first show, uh, uh, Not Fit, which is a mockumentary, um, really, really drove home a point to me that you may have a great product, but if you don't have the right distribution to the market, then you're kind of screwed. And um, I think that really, really shaped and continues to shape my thinking, which is that distribution is the most important thing that you can get as a business. Um, if you don't have distribution, nothing else will matter. And so if you have something that people are coming back to you for, you can build a business around that later. And, you know, this is a, the business of it can always come later. So that finding that fit is really important. 
And that's why, you know, you often, you know, people refer to product market fit. It's almost sometimes I like to call it market product fit because your product is fitting into a market. Yeah. Right? So um, uh, putting the market first, uh, you know, is, is interesting and finding the right way to get to them is, is extremely important. And without that, uh, you know, we felt that we had made a great show and, you know, it is a great show. You watch it today, you'll still laugh and, um, you know, some of our compatriots and peers in an industry where people are always very polite with each other and give each other mm -hmm. non-committal answers on how good creatively a show is. We were getting the biggest plaudit saying this is a bold, innovative thought and it's unbelievable that at the kind of budgets that something like this has been executed, the, um, the acting is good, the, you know, it's, it's fresh, yet the audience didn't see it that way and that's because we hadn't built a big enough audience and I think um, that was a, for me, that was one of the key, uh, key lessons where we thought, yeah, this is going to do extremely well, but it took, it took some time to get there from then. Yeah. I think another thing that not fit taught us before I go into a second example is that, um, earlier our, you know, content sensibilities were very inward looking, you know, mm -hmm. what we believed are, is high quality content, but the internet audience in India is so diverse that the 500 million people who are watching content on their smartphones are not like yourself. So it also actually shaped our mission to go from inward looking to outward looking. Mm -hmm. So rather than saying, hey, we're going to create good quality or content for people like us, we went to saying, hey, we're going to solve boredom. So we are nobody to decide what is good quality or bad quality. What, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, our core would be just to understand the audiences and what they want and provide that to them. Right. So I think that's also something that NotFit taught us because even today uh, with the elite uh, crowd, NotFit works really, really well, but it just didn't work with a mass audience. Um, I think another example uh, could be, and it's not a, I don't like this word failure that much because I think, um, um, you know, each thing, uh, you know, is really- Teaches you something. So yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So I would say, you know, us shutting down filter copy writing the written product, which was mm -hmm. filter copy articles, uh, uh, you know, could be, you know, uh, was, was one of the things where we just, it, it was not working, you know. So basically, uh, when we launched filter copy, there was a video product and, and a written article product right and the written article product again was similar to those buzzfeedy kind of articles you know uh five things that will make you laugh today and like mm -hmm. 10 things that will you know like uh, you know make you miss your sister and like that kind of stuff and across genres also we covered sports we covered movies we covered um you know books etc and at that time you know scoop Hoop was doing well in the business buzzfeed india was doing well in the business and filtercopy.com started doing very well in the business as well um, uh, you know, then the written content model evolved to like, you know, going to instant article on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And we did evolve with all of those models, but at some point the writing was very, very clear on the wall again, uh, with an audience focus, anyone looking at audience preferences would realize very quickly that it's totally changing towards just watching and, you know, watching video content rather than the reading. Mm -hmm. And uh, keeping something alive for no reason where it's not growing so much uh, didn't make any sense. So we had a very good team. We, you know, nicely disbanded the team. We offered them other opportunities within the company and uh, moved on from that product. So I think that is also something very, very important. I think people hold on to legacy products or products that are, you know, have stopped working in the market too for too long and uh, they put money into they keep pouring money into those products i think there's nothing wrong with saying hey this worked for three years it doesn't work anymore um you know let's uh, close it and let's iterate right and let's take that same money those same intelligent people and put their energies towards something forward looking so as a company we are always trying to look forward talk to the audiences and predict future behaviors rather than stick to legacy behaviors. So that's another example. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, uh, Aditi, because you will find so many seasoned, seasoned, uh, legendary entrepreneurs who've found it hard to cut their losses because they have something they, they hold dear to them. 
um, and inevitably uh, leads to their downfall. So I think what you said was just extremely wise. Uh, Ashwin, do you have one more anecdote to share? You know, I was going to say the same thing that Ani did, but I think he said it uh, much better than I would have said it. So uh, we can move on from here. Okay, we we move on. Uh, I I. When we talk about entrepreneurship, we usually talk about traits and, you know, we do a lot of studies because we find that there are some people who are more inclined to being entrepreneurs than others. It doesn't mean everybody cannot, but there are some traits. I'd like each of you to talk about the one trait you think the other has that's particularly entrepreneurial or has held them in good stead. So, uh, uh, Ashwin, if you could talk about the one trait that you think uh, Anirudh has that holds him in good stead, and then Anirudh, maybe uh, you about Aditi. And Aditi, I, I have to put you on the spot to talk about your <laughs> <No> husband. <way>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a trait that more, you know, persistence or, or something that you think this person has and brings to the table. All right, I'm going to try to limit this to one trait because there's quite a few. A couple um, is also good, but the one you okay, think good. When, when you asked Ashwin to talk about 100 days, he technically talked about 900 days. So do be careful. 600, sometimes. 600. I talked about 600. Days. 14, 15, and 16. I skipped through most of uh, 15. Um, no, so look, I, I think one of the things about um, Anirudh, and, and I didn't know this as, as well as I'd known him before uh, we started working in this capacity together. Um, one of the things about him, which is most frustrating for me to watch, because I know this is not a quality I will have at any point in my life, but um, I benefit from uh, as his co-founder, is uh, he can be incredibly calm and patient and polite in the face of frustration, stupidity, and, um, and arrogance. Like, he just... I think there's always an eye on the bigger prize, and so he will never let it get to him and never let it affect mm -hmm. how he reacts and uh, i'm not like that so uh, you know if someone's you know being frustrating i will you will see that frustration written on my face you will hear it in my voice uh, you will hear it in the words that i use um so there's sometimes when that happens and we're both there i will defer to him because i know that we will end up leaving in a better position um, <laughs> if he has the last word and not me um you know so that's something that and, and i've made my peace with that it's not like, not even like i'm trying to change it anymore um <laughs> And the other thing which I am trying to work on, which I think, uh, you know, I would argue that Anirudh has more than most entrepreneurs I've even met in this country, and I've met a lot, um, is the ability to, like, he has just this big picture thinking, this vision uh, that you won't find in too many entrepreneurs. Most people are able to see problems from anything from a one foot to a hundred foot distance. Mm -hmm. um, Anirudh can do that, but he can also go all the way to a 10,000 or a hundred thousand foot distance. Uh, and shed light on the same problem. And, and oftentimes, the perspective from all of these points are quite different. And some of them fundamentally will alter how you build your business, or how you think about your business. So I think there's a certain audaciousness in the vision, um, you know, that that he has brought right from when he started the business, which I don't know many entrepreneurs that could have brought that to the table. I think that's a very, very valuable quality. The big picture, I find, um, even in small teams, I find that we get so caught up in some of the micro stuff that we miss the big picture. Yeah. So great one there. I'll just add one more to follow. Hey, 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 you can't do that. I was <laughs> going to say something about you, but then I realized <laughs> I would be out of line, so I didn't say it. No, you should go ahead, go ahead. I think we should say one, one thing about each other, I think. Go ahead. <laughs> should I? Then let, then let me go yes, first. Yes, this is a conversation. No rules. There are no okay, rules fine, here. Fine, fine. Please go ahead. So, because then I have one point. I think the, you know, just like I told you what was frustrating, but also the, you know, most interesting thing about Anirudh, just like that with Aditi, what I find the most frustrating when I'm on the opposite side of the table, but the most useful when I'm on the same side of the table is that she has the most unusual thought process. I'm not going to use any other word to describe it, but it's just unusual. Um, it is at times linear, at times non-linear. It is often tangential, but she has the ability to like, look at a problem from a view that nobody else is looking at it from. Uh, so, you know, most people will examine a situation in certain five, six, ten limited ways, but there's always an extra one. There's 11th way, and that's the way Aditi will look at it. And so we've been able to see sides of our business or the challenges we face on a day-to-day -day basis that honestly we would not have uh, been able to if Aditi was not there. And 
I use that personally when I like when I'm not able to make a decision or I'm looking at say I'm interviewing somebody or I'm trying to solve a problem. I will always put myself in the shoes and be like, well, how would Aditi approach this? Or sometimes I just go up to her and say, please tell me how you would approach this. <laughs> um, and then I find that there's usually a unique perspective to which I wouldn't have been able to get myself. Lovely. Anirudh, what, what, yeah. uh, what do you for, have to say about Aditi? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, one thing I really, you know, enjoy and benefit from, as Ashwin said also, is that she never gives up. So... Yeah. Um, and I'm more a lazy deal maker. So I like quickly making deals and moving forward, but she likes, she really pushes for, uh, things forward and that gets us that additional percent that is required, you know, to be great. I think so. I think that's, that's really something that is, uh, super, super valuable. And, um, you know, it, it always, uh, keeps us in good stead. Um, and with Ashwin, I think. Uh, you know, you said people get caught up in details, but I think the detail is so important that without that, you cannot churn out a good product. And I think he has the ability to find that attention to detail that is really required in execution, right? Uh, vision is in, uh, incomplete without execution. So that execution mindset and the ability to really, you know, break an operation down into making it a, a reality, I think that is, he has a great ability on that. And uh, you know, uh, I always, you know, when we work together, that's something that I always see that he'll, he'll bring out something like that. And when I work with both of them, like, I always know if I'm getting frustrated about something, uh, that's great because when I reflect on it half an hour, an hour later, that gives me a, you know, uh, the, that breakthrough thought, which is, okay, this is how we could actually do this. And, and that's something that, you know, all of us have a very open and transparent relationship. And that's something I value a lot. Right. Um, uh, you you were speaking to someone today and they, uh, you know they called us uh, warm shareholders or some, something of the sort and that's because um you know we we genuinely know each other for so long that um you know we are able to keep a bigger picture in mind as 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 we create value for everyone so that's something i think a lot of speed dating uh, entrepreneurs cannot have because they just don't have that level of trust or um, faith in each other to do the right thing Absolutely. I used to work with a fund, United Seed Fund. And one of the things that we looked for teams when we invested in was the marriage between uh, the founders, because you cannot undermine how important a role it is, because in the end, it is like a marriage. In this case, two people happen to be married. But even otherwise, um, you know, when you're, when you're in it for the long haul, that's so important. Aditi, I'm going to ask you to talk about the two gentlemen. So, yeah, sure. So about Anirudh, there are so many things uh, in addition to what Ashwin said. I think the one thing which I'm just always amazed by is just his ability to just read so much and like absorb so much information um, and then remember it all and then bring it up at the right points, quoting examples and names and figures. I just like somehow I'm never able to just cover all of the material, which is which I want to right to read or watch or whatever so i think that i really i it's just a he he also doesn't need to sleep so i think he's superhuman in some way because he has more waking hours than most of us um you know to do all of this and i think he's really generous um and uh, very calm in the just like uh, ashwin said i think uh, you know i couldn't stress it more he's while Ashwin and I will be beating our heads in different ways, I think I'm going to be like, okay, chill guys, don't worry, you know, we can make this happen, <laughs> blah, blah. So I think that is, uh, it's pretty amazing. And I think his dad is very much like that. And, you know, probably that's where he gets it from. Um, with Ashwin, um, I think he has the ability to call it early, mm. right? And that is valuable, but also I sometimes feel and maybe I, I don't know, maybe Ani, you feel the same way that can we can we play it out a little longer. Uh, but uh, he has that ability to kind of detach and call something early. Um, and I think that's again, that is also like some kind of vision. Um, it's very valuable. Uh, I think the way Ashwin looks at the world and his own life is that I have X number of days and I want to do the best thing possible with those days. I want to have the most fun. I want to create the most value. So let me not waste any time. Uh, and I think that's a very 
clear way to look at uh, yourself, your own life and the, the things you spend time on. And I think that's pretty incredible. Like, I don't know anyone else who's able to detach themselves the way he is. He's the YOLO flag bearer of pocket aces. <laughs> yeah, be, yeah. <laughs> from the sounds of it, I should be investing in the stock market. And I don't. <laughs> you know, I loved this bull. conversation. Um, I, I liked my introduction to the three of you. And, and one day, if we're all in the same city, I'd love to do Sunday brunch over champagne because you all sound like a lot of fun and have a lot of interesting perspectives. I like to end with some lighthearted questions. So I'm going to keep it short because it's the three of you. Each of you, your fav the favorite content you consume, Netflix. Ashwin, what do you, what's your favorite show on Netflix? I watch, so I'm, I parallelly watch five or six shows at the same time. So I can't have one. Okay, a couple. Show. Um, so obviously Succession is a recent favorite. Um, I, I, I discovered Louis CK very late. So I'm playing catch up now. And so, uh, you know, Louis and, and Lucky Louis, those shows I'm watching a lot right now. Aditi, what are you watching? All-time favorite show like of life is Friends. Uh, re uh, favorite show I've watched recently, Queen's Gambit. I think a oh, lot of Gambit. people will have the same answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Anirudh? Um, I think on Netflix, uh, Stranger Things. Otherwise, uh, uh, Succession uh, has been uh, extremely good. And I, in amongst Indian shows, I really liked Delhi Crime a lot. Um, uh, That's a scam. Great show. I loved Scam. Yeah, I really enjoyed Scam as well. And my last question, because this is about entrepreneurship, each of your entrepreneur icons. Oh, and if you feel like, hey, I don't have an entrepreneur icon, but I have someone who I really, really admire, that's fine too. But if it's an entrepreneur, that's better. Anirudh, who's your entrepreneur icon? Yeah, for me, it's Ray Dalio, the uh, founder of Bridgewater. I've always maintained that He's provided a roadmap for how to live your life, and that's helpful. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, person I re like reading the most um, is is Ben Horowitz for on entrepreneurship. So both of them are interesting gurus. I don't know if I can call them idols, but I definitely call them gurus of what they've done um, in their fields. Aditi, you. Um, you know, Sandhya, since you're, you worked at Unitas and, you know, you understand perhaps the impact sector as well. Um, I have idols who I've never worked with, but I think Vineet Rai will be like one mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneur who I've worked with extremely closely for five years and uh, really admire, you know, what he's built, raised money from some of the largest pension funds and, um, you know, uh, the DFIs of the world created an ecosystem where never, uh, you know, which never existed before in impact investing and, uh, you know, truly created and measured um, impact. So I really, really admire him. Otherwise, for me, Oprah Winfrey is the other entrepreneur that I really, really admire for several reasons. And Ashwin, your entrepreneur icon. You know, I don't have like an icon. I, I like to pick and choose traits from Mm -hmm. different people that I admire I, I think you know and some of these are going to be very cliched because because they are um, I just for the sheer audacity of imagining what could be possible I think like it's hard not to like look at Elon Musk uh, as a rarefied mm -hmm. uh, object on earth I mean he's just just the the sheer audacity and not just the audacity but the the guts to follow through on that right uh, so you know quote unquote skin in the game right if you spend almost all the money you have you know betting on um, the vision that you have that just takes a special kind of person. Um, but then there are several others, right? Like people like you know Bill Gates have been sus have sustained their uh, abilities for so many years. Uh, Warren Buffett as well have sustained their ability for you know decades. Um, you know I, I love like um, you know some of the stuff like like Don Valentine, right? What he created with Sequoia and that culture. Um, you know it's just so there's a lot of people and you can kind of attribute different things. Like uh, you know I, I like also for example how some of these entrepreneurs codify, right? Anirudh mentioned uh, Ray Dalio. I think one of the best things Ray Dalio did was to codify his thought process and his framework uh, so well. Uh, and Reed Hastings has done that so well as well. Uh, and, you know, I find that that's a huge gift to the sub subsequent generation because it's not like, I feel like we tend to mystify these, um, these entrepreneurs or anyone who excels in any field, we tend to mystify them, uh, but we never really understand how they do it. 
uh, and when they go as far uh, as to try to document that it's really really beneficial for anyone that looks up to them and and i think that you know um, gates i personally think is the most underrated did, yeah. uh, under uh, kind of talked about uh, entrepreneur because what he's done with the gates foundation and just putting your you know there's one thing to be able to give money to something and there's another thing to be give your intellect to that i think he's done a tremendous job and it shows you that uh, you know entrepreneurship you know if you put your mind to something you can make it happen and he, it's unbelievable what he's done and actually one of my favorite shows you were asking on netflix was watching inside the uh, yeah. it was it was phenomenal to watch it and yeah. high, very very inspiring bill gates is one of our funders so i cannot agree more oh. uh, with you maybe we But, already knew that <laughs> aditi ashwin anirudh a real pleasure i i really enjoyed this conversation thank you so much like thank you so much yeah, a lot of fun yeah take care take care